Okay. Thanks for coming out today. Um, we're going to talk about single responsibility, separation of concerns. Uh, so as the uh, gentleman said, I'm Don Belcham. I'm from Edmonton, Canada. Uh, holy, it's getting dark. Um, the, uh, my blog, sorry, my blog, digwithcoder.com. You can send me an email um, at that address anytime, ask me questions, whatever you like. Uh, feel free to do that. Uh, we pretty much covered this stuff off. I guess the one thing to say is that JetBrains has been good enough. They're the makers of Dot Trace and uh, ReSharper, which are both good uh, .NET tools. They've been good enough to give me a couple licenses of uh, software to give away to you guys at the end. So uh, don't run out if you want to get some free stuff. We'll do it right at the end of the presentation here. Uh, so let's start and get going on this. Single responsibility. How many people know what single responsibility is? Okay, so we got a couple hands here. So single responsibility, this is the actual definition, or well, it's kind of a slang definition for it. Uh, there should be one reason and only one reason to change a class. So if you're going into a class and you're going to have to write code for it, you should only have one reason to change that code you're doing. Now, one reason doesn't necessarily mean one business reason. It means one reason from the code structure. So if the class is formatting a name or it's uh, maybe calling out to a stream writer to do something to the uh, to a persisted to a disk. There should be only one reason that something like that is happening in there. I really should have brought my presentation mouse to do this. So responsibilities equals reason for change. Single responsibility equals a reason for change, and it's approximately equal to a concern. So if the, you have single responsibility you most likely have a good separation of concerns in your code. Uh, how many people understand se separation of concerns? Okay, so a few of you guys. So this stuff here isn't really all that dominant in .NET development right now. For some reason over time, we've backed away from it, and not ignored it, but we haven't put it at the forefront of our development effort. Java, they definitely do. They're much more robust OO programming style. The language is just as capable as C-sharp and the other way around, but for some reason the community has gone down the road of adhering to these things. So feel free to ask questions at any time in here too. So, Okay, so multiple reasons to change. So you guys probably can't see that all that well, can you? All right, so we'll tell you what's going on. This is a method called process file. Uh, first thing that's happening in it is it's opening up a new stream reader, it's reading each line, looping over it, and replacing the name Donald or the text Donald with Frank. And then it's uh, opening up a stream writer, looping over everything that's inside this lines collection, and writing it out to the stream writer, and then flushing the stream writer so it's persisted to disk. So it's pretty, and it's using the same file name, so it's actually overwriting the existing file with the new file. There's multiple things going on in this code, right? You guys can see the three, four things going on in here? You can? Okay. So the first thing that's going on is we're reading the data. So now we've got one reason to change this code. If we have to change how we're reading the data, or where we're getting the data from even, this is one reason we, uh, to be in here changing it. The next reason is this replace, right? The second thing that's going on in the code. So if, if we have to change this, I mean, this is a pretty trivial uh, example because we've got burned in values, right? But if we wanted to change that so that we were, maybe we're modifying, we're passing in the replacement to value as a parameter up here, that would be a second reason to change the code. Then we're writing it out. So we're persisting to, in this case, a file system. But we're just, in general, we're persisting the data. So maybe we want to change that from the file system to be able to pers persist to, say, a database, maybe. We're taking, we're reading it in from a file, we're changing it, we're persisting to a database. That's a third reason to change this, uh, this class. So the problem with this is that it's, everything's tightly coupled together, right? We've got this situation where for me to change how we process a file, I, or, and, and I have to change this down here, which may affect this up here, which may affect that there. Things are tied together. So these are ways to tell if this is um, 
multiple change reasons. So just jump back to here. So we've got these three reasons or three things happening in here. The name's pretty general, right? It's process file. Well, what's process file doing? I mean, it doesn't mean a lot, right? The, the intent of the method isn't very, very clear. So if you couldn't read this, which most of you can't because the font's way too small, if I told you that this method was called process file, who could tell me what exactly it was doing if that's all you knew? You just can't, right? You don't know that it's modifying the name or replacing the name Donald with Frank. You just don't know that from the name, so there's no really good intent. So if I was to try and name this really well, the, the method name would probably be something like uh, read file, change name, and persist. Well, that's really a bad name for a method. I mean, it's just too much stuff going on, right? So that's one of the things, or ways you can tell. It's not a hard, fast rule, but it's one of the ways that you can tell if you don't have good single responsibility. It's hard to name the method, or class even. So if you want to name a class, and you find that to specifically say what it's doing, you end up writing a whole sentence, then you probably have multiple responsibilities or concerns even in there. Testing it is really hard to do. That's another good way of telling. So if we go jump back to this code again, writing an automated unit test for this is not easy. The only way to test it is to pass in a file name. Actually have a file on the disk, pass in a file name, and check the output. You know, in this case, we'd have to check the file after the methods run. I, in that case, I don't know if the replacement has happened, right? I can't test, did the replacement of the name actually happen? It's not easy to do. Only way I could do it is check that output file on the disk, open it up, go through, see if any instances of the word Donald existed in the file whatsoever. I can't compare the two, though, because I don't have the old file anymore to say every place that Donald existed did it get changed to Frank. You know, it, so if I actually, this code actually ran something or some other process happened and Donald was changed to Frank, but in one place it was changed to John, I can't test that that actually happened and would cause, you know, that would be a failing test if, in this case. Really, really hard to test this because there's so much going on in it. Another way, and this, these, are, these are guidelines, right? So this third one really is a guideline. Don't take this as being gospel at all. Lines of code inside a method or a class. How many people have lines of or a, a method that has you know 500 lines of code in it, or have seen them? It happens all the time, right? They're just out there. It's a lot of stuff going on. If you got 500 lines of code, a thousand, or like some I've seen with 30,000 lines of code, there's more than one thing going on in there, right? You can't have. In some cases, you can have a lot of code. I've, I've written translators to take a domain model and translate them into a DTO, and maybe there's 40 lines of code in there because you need 40 things to happen. But it's very simple, it's just property equals this, property equals that, property equals this. It's not doing anything more than translating a value from one thing to another. So lines of code is just a rough thing, but if you see a lot of lines of code in a method, probably should be a trigger that at least consider that the responsibility is not singular in it. If you find you're using control C, control V, reuse, how many people do uh, do that? I want to do good code reuse, Can copy paste, done, right? Okay, you're probably running into problems there. Now you've got the exact same code in two places. First of all, that's a problem. Now you've got that single responsibility or single concern in two places. That single concern should be in one place and used by both things as, as needed. Um, it is the easiest way to move code and make things happen but it, uh, it's not a very good practice, right? So that, that's another concept that might help. Any questions on how you tell if single responsibility is not being adhered to? You guys need to liven up. I've only got 15 slides, man. <laughs> really, I've only got 15 slides. That's not a joke. <laughs> no, no questions at all? Pardon me? You'll ask later? You guys want to do that? You guys want to ask at the end instead of in the middle? Because I'll ask in the middle. I'm fine with that. Okay, we'll do it at the end. We're going to have lots of end then. Okay, with single responsibility, delegating off to another class or method doesn't count against, against the single responsibility. 
So again, you probably can't read this code, but we're looking at it, it's uh, retrieve customers to list. The first thing that's happening is we're doing a fetch all, get all customers from the database repository or the persistent repository. We don't even know if it's a database, it's just a repository, right? Second thing that's happening in there on the last line is we're returning a translation. This is kind of what I was talking about just a, a second ago. We're taking that list of customers, translating them using a translator. So the first line is delegating off to a repository to get the list. Doesn't count for single responsibility. It's delegating off. Not our, it's not our concern what it's doing. We're just controlling the fact it needs to happen. The second line is doing a translate all using and passing in a translator. Again, doesn't count for single responsibility because we're just saying something needs to happen. We're a traffic cop in this sense. Just do this, do this, do this. So you could say there's zero responsibility here because we're delegating to everything. But there really is one responsibility and that is to coordinate. So it's coordinating the retrieval of customers to list. Kind of make sense? You guys are just way too lively today, man. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You're going to fall asleep on me, aren't you? All right, we're not going to do the demo right now. Um, I'm going to bore you with slides. We're almost done, though. <laughs> uh, segmenting code, okay, for separation of concerns. So a concern is almost like a single responsibility. It is more a way of representing functionality. So the concern of a repository, say customer repository, like we looked at in the previous slide, the concern of that is retrieval of data. The concern of the translator is to convert data from one format to another. So from one class structure to another class structure. So it, it's not quite responsibility, single responsibility, but it's really close. So if you're doing good separation of concern, you're probably doing good single responsibility. If you're doing good single responsibility, you got a half decent chance that you're doing good separation of concern as well. So I like to think of uh, single responsibility as the little bubbles of code. Separation of concern is more about horizontal slices. So the concern of this layer is data access. And then it's split up into little bubbles of customer repository. So that's about repository or retrieving data or persisting data for customer. So you've got little pieces inside that layer and each one of those is a concern. I think we're on slide 13 of 15 there. So uh, when you're working in your code, one of the questions you should be asking yourself is, look at your code and say, what is this doing? And if you can say one thing, that's good. Right? If you go in there, what is this doing? It's opening a stream reader, it's changing a value, it's closing a stream reader. That's, that's a problem, right? You've got, you, you, you're saying it's doing three different things. But you have to watch how trivial you make that uh, assertion of what is it doing. Oh yeah, it's getting the stuff, it's looping over it, it's translating or it's converting a value, it's looping over it to do something else. Looping doesn't, looping isn't really a responsibility, right? That's just a function of how you need the code to execute. So the, what's occurring within the loop probably is a responsibility, possibly is a responsibility. Depends on what your code's doing. So if you go through, you list stuff off, and you think, what is this doing? Then you're, then you're talking about, and you list more than one thing, then you're talking about breaking uh, single responsibility probably, and separation of concerns possibly. For separation of concerns, one of the things I like to look at and, and say is, what is this supposed to do overall? The job of this class is to persist data to the database, or persist data in general. That's a concern. If I look at it and say the job of this class is to translate and persist data, I've got two concerns. So it's all about you know the and or and or thing. So if you look at a class and you say um, this is this class is to format format names as using an American format or a Canadian format, that's two responsibilities or two concerns possibly. It's one 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 concern probably because we're looking at and talking about formatting a name, one concern. But we have two responsibilities because we're talking about formatting in American or Canadian. If it delegated off to two different classes there, might not be two different responsibilities. But if the code was in line where it said, if American, 
format this way, or else, or else if Canadian, format this way, then we're probably breaking a single responsibility. So on this, again, I, I apologize. I didn't anticipate the slide or the screens being so small and so far away from you. Uh, on this one here, we're looking at uh, it's actually that same piece of code again. So from a separation of concern standpoint, what is it doing? Well, it's doing a couple things. It's persisting data and it's modifying data. Those should be separate concerns. So we should probably have a uh, we should probably delegate off to something that is treats the stream reader for pulling the data out of the file as a repository. So maybe it becomes a customer file repository, something like that. We call off the customer file repository, then we delegate off to a name replacement or a name replacement class, and then we delegate off again to a customer file repository dot save, where we save the data. So we have multiple concerns going on in here as well. One is the storage of data and retrieval of data, and the other is the changing of data. So single responsibility to me is the foundation of everything OO, everything. So these are different uh, concepts within OO, co cohesion, immutability. Um, I don't know why I have high and lowering. Okay, high cohesion's bad, I know that. Uh, or no, high cohesion's good. Okay, I always get this wrong. You have cohesion and coupling. You want low coupling and high cohesion. Single responsibility will help you with your cohesion. Cohesion's about making sure that a class is concerned only within itself. It's not using a lot of external, it doesn't rely on external stuff directly. Indirectly it might, but not directly. You wanna make sure that you have high cohesion you don't want to be tightly coupled, which is the other thing. Tightly coupled to another class. That means you don't have a way of changing that other class that you're working with. Uh, immutability is a class that doesn't change. You, or it doesn't change anything else, sorry. It can change itself, but it doesn't change anything else. Uh, so separation of concern helps you with all of the, or single responsibility helps you with all of these things. Uh, it also helps you with if, dependency injection, which is reducing coupling. It sets you up to do, uh, uh, what else will it set you up for? Sorry, I'm drawing a complete here today on this for some reason. Okay, so how many people are familiar with patterns? Gang of Four patterns. Okay, you read the book? Great book if you haven't read it. Gang of Four, I don't know who it's all by. Something, something, something at all is what it says. Uh, it's a fantastic book. One of the patterns in there is uh, facade, right? Wrap something so it, it uh, appears slightly different than uh, another thing. Single responsibility on that class, you can wrap that really easily. You're just easy to wrap it. That's single responsibility for that wrapper, that facade as well. Uh, a decorator class, you've got a class that does one thing only, you need to slightly modify it so something happens just before it. Say you want to wrap a uh, customer repository class so that it has security around it, right? You can only access the database or the data store if you have right security permissions. So you got that repository class that does all the data access for you, or at least organizes data access. You want to wrap it with a, a secure customer repository class, decorate it, just throw a class around it, and you can call off to a security layer class. Single responsibility, you just delegate off to that other class that does security, says yes or no, you do or don't have permission, and then it's, you can say, if I have permission, push it through to the underlying customer repository and, and give me access. If I don't have permission, maybe you throw an exception, something like that. So the single responsibility gives you the power to wrap these things easily, modify the behavior really, really easily without having to go inside of the class and do it there. You don't want to have to modify customer repository to add in something like security. It's not the concern of customer repository to deal with security, right? Its concern is data access to and from some kind of data store. So you want to be able to pull those two things, those two uh, concerns apart, but still wrap them together and single responsibility will help you immensely with that type of thing. Uh, because you're dealing with classes that have one tiny little thing going on, I'm usually tiny, maybe there's 15, 20 lines of code, uh, 
you're going to have a lot easier time understanding it. How many people have read a 500 line method, by the time you get to the bottom, you don't remember what's going on at the top? I mean, that happens all the time to me. If the bigger the method, the less likely I know what's going on up at the top by the time I get to the bottom. If you're having that problem, single responsibility will give you a little snippet. You can look through it, you know, maybe you don't even have to look at the code. The name of the class is so clear and so intent revealing that you know exactly what it's doing inside just by reading the name of it. So much easier to work in code if that's happening. You know, the, the concept of being able to understand your code quickly and easily is remarkably powerful in the productivity that you get. Productivity stuff is, again, really important because we all have deadlines. You know, you go to work and the manager's there, you say, that stuff I gave you seven hours to do, how about we get that done tomorrow? Fantastic, right? If you can do good SRP, good SOC, you're going to have the ability to change stuff much quicker. Project I was on earlier, um, well, last year now, I guess, uh, the developers would go in to change the code and project management would say, oh yeah, that change, there's going to, you know, they were, they were uh, estimating tasks and they would say, that change is a medium, a medium level task, 150 hours. That's what they were estimating for a developer to do something. And a medium level task, I kid you not, would be something like adding eight controls to a screen and persisting the data to the database. 150 hours. The code had such poor single responsibility that it took the developer that much time to work through and modify things, realize what the side effects of the modifications were, and verify that it worked uh, properly at the end. We changed over, started refactoring the code to single responsibility, and we were able to take medium level estimates and drop them from 150 hours, roughly, down to 20 hours, maybe. And 20 hours including unit testing time. So you can speed up the way that you write the code. You're, when you're writing the code, you're writing just one little thing. It's really fast and easy to write one tiny little thing if you know exactly what you're trying to accomplish in there. If you're trying to write that much stuff, well, you have to think about it all as you're working through it. I find myself, I get part way through it, like, okay, well, let's reevaluate what we're doing here. Well, oh, I gotta go back up there. I missed something, add it back in and go through. But if I did a little bit, all the way through, I can orchestrate how the code works amongst itself uh, after the fact. Get all the little pieces it needs to do done, orchestrate it afterwards. So you have way, way faster codings um, when you're doing this. There are some people that will argue against it though. One of the things that happens at a single responsibility is you get increased code or number of classes. I don't think that's a big deal. Right? If you refactor, I refactored or had my team refactor two methods in two, or sorry, two classes that had a whole slew of methods. The class represented a concern instead of a responsibility. So we had a whole bunch of or methods inside of a class, wanted to refactor every method out to its own class. We went from two classes to 150, 180 classes, something like that. Everyone had one job though, it was much clearer what they were doing. People say, oh, you know, you open up Solution Explorer and Visual Studio, that's a whole bunch of stuff every time I go look there now. I gotta wade through it all. It is. The purpose of uh, Visual Studio, though, is one of the purposes anyways, is to act as a mechanism for organizing code files. It's what it's there to do. It helps you organize them. So you can do things like put that file, that concern, into a folder. So all translators go into a folder called translators, maybe. That's your then you namespace it that way. So now if you want to look at names or translators, that concern, you just open up the folder, there you go, 180 translators. The names of each translator are very clear. The intent is right there. It's what it's doing, it's the name. It's not hard to navigate 180 translators if you know that you're looking for the customer to customer listing translator. That that's the name of it. It's customer to customer listing translator. So having all these files doesn't necessarily make it harder to navigate or manage. Uh, in the code base or in Visual Studio. Certainly doesn't make it any harder with your or your source code repository, right? If your source co code repository can't handle 180 files, you better be building really small applications or else you're not going to have any source code control. Some people t would say it, it doesn't hurt to ignore SRP and SOC. Uh, the problem with ignoring it 
is that you work yourself into a bit of a hole. Uh, if you go and look at a curve for development or developer uh, effort for change after the code's been written, standard curve is that on, on a project is that you start really easy and it's slowly, the more time you spend on the project, the harder and harder it gets. So if you have time on the bottom axis and difficulty on the Y axis, it'll be low and it'll ramp up. So the farther into the project you get, the harder it is, the more effort required to make a change. If you're, if you're not doing SRP, SOC very well, that will happen. The more code you get, the more entangled it gets, the harder it is to make a change. If you're doing good SRP, SOC, it's actually almost the inverse. So you're going to have a little bit of difficulty to start with. You're going to have a lot of ramp up time because you're building a lot of classes right up front. You're doing a lot of namespace organizing, that type of thing. Lots up, to, up front, but it'll actually taper off. It becomes really easy at the end. So if you've got, like the project I'm on right now, we're seven months into the project, say. Uh, we have, I would guess, we probably have like seven, 800 classes in, the, in Visual Studio showing up. We only have about 6,000 lines of code in the entire application. It's a really small application right now. Uh, for us to go change something, you want to change how data shows up on the screen, that, there's like two hours worth of work done. It's really easy. Yeah. Surprising, uh, like you said about how to not navigate code. Yep. Uh, for people who actually use Visual or people who come from Java or use application, yep. that's not an issue at all. It's not an issue if you have good tooling. You're right. Yeah. So if you go, if you're in Visual Studio, plain Visual Studio, yeah. navigating files means opening up Solution Explorer, navigate down, maybe with your mouse or your arrows or whatever, you navigate down, highlight it, hit enter. With ReSharper, you can just do like control. Control Shift N, Control N as well. Control Alt N works if you're doing a file name. You just do that. Little pop-up window comes up. Type in your name. You can do it with if you're doing uh, Pascal casing. You could do something. Actually, you know what? I'll just show it. We'll actually have code demo for you. But uh, you can do something. It's really easy to navigate. Uh, tooling's important. One of the things I uh, consider Visual Studio to be is the best tool to host ReSharper. ReSharper is my development tool, really. Visual Studio is just a container that hosts ReSharper for me and organizes my files. So ReSharper is that powerful for you, and it helps with all the navigation stuff. Um, class count doesn't matter. Uh, finding files doesn't matter anymore. Finding methods doesn't matter uh, if you end up refactoring code. So if your code base has classes with 100 methods in it, and you've got to refactor that, finding the method name is really easy with ReSharper as well. When you're in a small class, it only has one method on it. It doesn't matter. You know where it is. It's the only code there, right? So these arguments against are, I think they're not, they're people not really looking at the problem and realizing the impact that it has, and they're just kind of making up sloppy excuses for not doing it. So any other questions or comments on this? Okay. A, uh, build file. Maybe use NAT or MS build or something like that. Push it out into its own file. It's separation of concerns at a process level, right? My concern, the, the concern of my visual, uh, visual Studio is being able to write code. The concern of NAT is being able to build code. The concern of, well, depending on what you use, NAT maybe again is to deploy code or create releases for code. Things like that. So consider what your tool is and what it should be doing for you as well. But Visual Studio very much is a file management, file organizing tool. Uh, I think we talked about the rest of that. This is the last slide, so we're just knocking off here, eh? Not enough time for you guys to fall asleep on me. We're halfway through already. Okay, that's cool. All right, so challenge all your assumptions. Um, always assume that your code can be improved with single responsibility. Uh, even if your code is really tight, really small method, something like that, always assume that you might have another responsibility in there. You probably don't if it's really tight and small amount of code. You know, five lines of code in a class. You probably don't have multiple responsibilities. But look at it and just always reevaluate, do I? You know, it's never bad to have good code. It's never bad to refactor code to be easier to work with. You know, you always pay for it in the end if you don't. Or if you get sloppy and you just say, ah, I won't hurt to add this in here. Right? You'll pay for that down the road. Um, also, 
take this and really consider how it's going to affect your team. I, I went into a team where they hadn't done strong SRP. They, their skill set of the developers wasn't quite there. Uh, you ha I had to ease them in. So if you think that SRP is a concept that your guys or your the ladies on your team don't have, uh, ease them in. Introduce them to it a little bit at a time. Write your code so it's SRP maybe, and then talk to them and show them. Say, hey, this is why. Better yet, show them how easy it is to make a modification when you have to. Right? You don't have to go in and you know debug this entire massive method. I just have to work with this one little method, and I can write an e easily write an automated unit test for it. So consider all these things um, with your team. You know, just jumping in and saying, we got to refactor it all or write it all as SRP from now on might completely overwhelm the people on your team. This is the last slide. So, any questions? Let's do the questions before we do the uh, the code demo. We'll show ReSharper off and we'll do some single responsibility refactoring. Yep. Uh, what is the case where some, sometimes it's really difficult to separate two, uh, the, the two things John said, uh, yep. they are so correlated with each other. Yep. It's difficult to separate them, like on the basis of single responsibility or whatever. Yep. So in that case, what, what should be in the uh, So I think that it's it can be difficult to separate them, but you can all, you always can separate them, I think. So what I find, if it's really, really hard, two things are tied closely together, like that class we were, method we were looking at, the reading and the writing, it was tied really close together because a file name required for both of them, um, that type of thing. Uh, what you can do with that is write a controller class, so like a service class, that takes care of handling the steps that need to be done for you, and instead of just passing a file name around, between the classes, you probably are going to pass around more things. So you pass a file name in that case, maybe a stream writer or reader. Maybe you have some. Maybe you create another class to wrap the data that's being brought out. You, but you pass multiple things around instead of just one thing. Uh, but it is difficult in some cases because of how the code's um, tied together and written. What you, I think you need to do at that point, consider how it's written. Maybe it's not written in the best way. Maybe it's. Um, maybe it's too intertwined and you can pull it out and, and get rid of the intertwinedness. As soon as you can get rid of the intertwinedness in that one method by itself, then you refactor to SRP really easily. So I, I think that's probably the best approach is to do that. Anything else? Absolutely. So that's one of those challenges or, or arguments that people make. It's harder to read. It's harder to debug is another one. Yep. And we had a state back in document. So yeah, if you had it other than I state, you just call it state or state. Yep. Now the problem is when somebody new came to the project and couldn't expect to understand what we call it down. Uh, yep. So these guys we have states and transitions and then we have to figure out valid transitions. Right. It's easier to read. Right. So the, the statement being made is that having things split apart into seven or eight different classes or whatever it ends up being, it makes it hard to navigate, know how they're tied together, what's the behavior between the classes. Uh, whereas having that one method, it's all right there. I mean, if you've got to figure it out, you can figure it out there without having to navigate between all the classes, figure out you know, what's being dependency injected, what's, what method or lambda is being passed through, or you know, maybe you've got a delegate that's being pushed through as a parameter to another class. It's a little easier if you have just the one thing. Uh, I would say that the argument for knowing how things interact together uh, can be augmented through good integration tests. So you write a test that says, in the scenario that the state of this object is this, um, you know, this, this, and this should happen kind of thing. So you write your test to explain how the code works and how it interacts and then mimic that inside the test. So it acts in, the test acts in two fashions then for you. One, it tells you in its name exactly what's going on, how you expect the code to work. And then if you really need to know the details of how it's working, it's all right there as an entry point for you. So because you're right, if you just go and look at you know, the state.save or something like that, what's going on, how does it work, all these things are happening. But if I say, oh yeah, if it's in this state, it should save this way or something like that, 
um, I can see it, I can understand it a lot better there. So, anything else? Yeah. Right. Now, assuming that I have piece of code and given what information I have, I don't know that it requires change and I don't know that it requires reuse. Wouldn't I subordinate single repository principle to simplicity? Right. So, the, um, if you didn't hear it, he's talking about saying single responsibility. Um, should I use single responsibility over simplicity or the other way around? Right. Uh, I guess the first thing I would say is never refactor code for reuse unless that's exactly what your intent is. You know that you need to reuse it at that point in time. Don't refactor for future reuse. That's probably the best way of saying it. So I, when I start writing my stuff, um, so the translator class is a perfect example. Translators can be written with a generic interface on them. Translate, I translate, um, TK, to and from, or source and destination kind of thing. Uh, I, when I, I, even though I write this pattern in every application I use, I never start with that pattern. I work to it. When it needs to be there, I use it. Otherwise, I don't use it. Uh, so I think simplicity is definitely a key, but I want to have my code structured in a way that one thing is happening. That's simplicity, right? My method's only doing one thing. That's simplicity, isolated simplicity. Uh, I think simplicity in the sense that I don't have all these interactions between classes is a little bit, um, it's dangerous because you're getting into monolithic code. Monolithic code's hard to change. So I would rather, you always know that you're gonna change. I mean, that's a one given in our industry, right? Everything changes, guaranteed. Um, so I, I'm planning for change in the sense of having code that's structured in a way it's easy to change is a really good thing over simplicity, I think. It adds simplicity in the end, right? But simplicity can be applied to so many things. Is it simple to change? Is it simple to code? Is it simple to read? Is it simple to understand? So it depends on where you want your simplicity to go in some ways, right? I guess I was trying to argue that uh, you could delay your decision to introduce single repository principle. Uh, de delay the initiative to use it. Um, you could. Uh, do you want to have to deal with the, the possibility that you're not going to do it, right? It's this whole last responsible moment is another um, practice. When's the last responsible moment to do something? And don't do anything until then. So in your case, you're saying the last responsible moment for using single responsibility. When that occurs, then start worrying about single responsibility. To me, the last responsible moment for single responsibility is the one, first line of code I write in the application. Um, I need single responsibility to ensure that all these other things are available to me, right? If I start writing monolithic code, I can't do proxies, decorators, facades all that easily. I know I'm probably gonna need those in my code. So the last possible moment for making that decision is right at the beginning for me. Make sense? Okay, anything else? You guys are all falling asleep after that awesome lunch, aren't you? inside of one method. Uh, so does code access security, um, modeling and logging, that type of stuff all inside of one? Um, it depends on how it's written, but uh, logging is a really good example, right? I, you gotta log stuff in certain areas. I would, um, there's two ways you could do it. One, you could decorate a class, and so log the entry and log the exit. But if you need to log inside the class, that doesn't help you, right? You know, log every time it loop, you loop over something, something like that. Um, in the, uh, what I find is I, I don't go too far with the logging and single responsibility. I'll put logging right inside of the class if it's necessary there, but I'm always delegating out to a logger, right? I'm not doing open stream writer, you know, put the line in, that kind of thing. I delegate off to a static logging class that it takes care of everything. Its concern is logging. It knows what logging framework I'm using, how to format it, all that kind of stuff. So it's just delegating off. And delegating doesn't count against single responsibility. Uh, same with uh, security. You, you, if you delegate off to a security thing, that's cool too. But usually in security, you delegate off and then you check, did it return true or false? Or something like that, right? Did, do I have access or don't have access? Uh, that check is now probably gonna break single responsibility. So that's why I usually with security type stuff, I'll decorate the actual class that needs security within it. If you have multiple security checks within a piece of code, 
you probably have multiple responsibilities within a piece of code. Each one of those should be split out and wrapped with security individually. Global, yeah. Um, so logging is kind of like a global counter. It's a global piece of functionality, right? Uh, with that, it's, it's tough. You got to figure out how you're going to do it, but still be able to isolate it off so that you have a class that's responsible for counting. Maybe it's a static class or, you know, it's a singleton class. That's probably the way you do it. Singleton class where you can do um, class.instance.add value or something like that. You delegate off to that from within your code. You're not breaking single responsibility anymore. It's still globally, because it's a singleton, it's out there always in memory, right? So you can do, there's lots of techniques to be able to do that type of thing. Um, but you got to figure out what works best, what are the problems that you need to solve. But you, usually you can delegate off to something else. Anything else? Okay, we'll look at a little bit of code maybe then. You guys want to look at code? Is that what we're here for? All right, so we've got about 15 minutes here. So we'll use, um, I don't know if any of you guys were in my uh, presentation yesterday. We're going to use the same thing as pet shop, the infamous pet shop code. And it's actually quite horrible. We'll, re we'll just look at refactoring a little bit of it. So we'll look at it from a single responsibility standpoint, mostly, and we'll look and say, does a method have single responsibility or not? So let's look at, uh, that bigger, that's bigger, you can read that a little better than the other stuff, right? Okay, so this is a, uh, a sign-in security type of thing that's going on here. We've got uh, quite a few things going on. First thing is a validation. You know, it's checking to see if it's string empty and I don't know what the other part is there, but. So if, both, if either the password or the username are empty, return null. Essentially, don't log me in. Uh, the next thing is it's going to go to the data access layer. It's going to create an account. And uh, it's going to try and sign in. Why? I have no idea why it's creating an account. I can tell you what it's doing here. The code is reads horribly. So the, that first line, accountfactory.create, we're creating a repository. Uh, the pet shop code has a concept of either being able to write to SQL or Oracle, read and write to SQL or Oracle. So that factory is actually loading up the Oracle or the SQL one. Uh, the next thing it does is it does dal.signin. So it's actually checking to see if it can sign in. Then it returns the value back. So we've got lots of responsibilities happening here, but we're delegating off to them. This one here, we're delegating off to figure out what repository to use. This uh, account sign-in thing, we're delegating off to the repository to try to do the sign-in. Uh, this return doesn't really count because we could just put that up here if we wanted to. But this up here, this trimming, like validation stuff, is it's it's a it's a guard clause, right? We're checking a guard clause to see if we should return null or process it on. Uh, to me, that doesn't really fit in here. It's not sign in and verify credential or uh, validate values. It's just sign in. To me, sign in should be just doing this bottom line here of dal dot sign in, which we could run off of here. We could do new account factory dot create. Actually, why don't we just write the line? We do new account factory dot create dot sign in. So we could, we could change it to do that. We get rid of all this noise down here. It's all line noise that doesn't really make sense to us, or do, doesn't need to be there. So we're just saying, go to the factory, create it, and sign in. Two responsibilities. This one's delegating it off, though. So it's not really, it doesn't really count. This one's not delegating it off. Um, the question is, do you want to pull that out? In this case, maybe not. Um, I would probably pull it out, though. 
I, I consider that validation. Um, I'm validating the values coming in. So I would probably pull it out and then just do a, I don't know, if I, um, I, would, I would have two validations. I would validate user ID, validate password, right? So I check, I say if validate user ID or and, oh no, in this case it's an or. So I do if validate user ID or validate password, return no or not, either one of them return no. Single responsibility, responsibility of each of those two classes is validate one value, the password, validate the username. We just delegate off to it. This now becomes just a service layer class that coordinates all the things that need to be done. So we could just do, create a new class, this is Reach Sharper, so we could create a new class. Uh, we could do return, or public, uh, Bool for we could return username to check equals we'll make it not equals empty. So this returns true if it's valid and returns false if it's not. So we could change this and now say if uh, new new user, is that what I called it? Validate username. So I've just, I've just made this piece here disappear. Oh, I didn't want to page down. So that's exactly the same thing as was there before, except I'm delegating off to another class to do the validation. So if I have to go change how I validate that user ID, I don't have to change this code. I can validate my user ID, change my validation. This is the navigation thing we were talking about actually. I'll show you this right now. Resharper navigation, I just did control N. I can say validate user name, just VU, because I've got camel casing in there, or Pascal casing, and it brings up the list. If I just do V, I get view state pager as well. So instead of having to go over here and navigate through where is it, all that type of thing, I can just do it inside the ID. Number of classes inside my project don't matter anymore. I can quickly navigate them based on name. So if I want to change this now, so because this is a string, this user ID or username to check that we're passing in, we should probably check it's null, right? Null is probably going to blow something up if empty is going to. So we could say, make that not. The string class oh. already has that Sorry? The string class already has that method. So why do you need to create a separate class for it? Well, this is a trivial example, that's why. <laughs> but. You're right, I could. I could have, well, what I probably would have done is wrote an extension method that wrapped the is null or empty. Um, I prefer, I don't know, how many of you guys are familiar with extension methods from C Sharp 3.0? How many people are actually using C Sharp 3.0.NET 3.5? Most of you using 2.0? Is everyone else using 2.0? Yeah, okay. So the, the feature um, that we could use is I could do public static um, is null or empty this string username, or this string value. Uh, hang on, I got something wrong there. The heck? Oh, that's, okay, I'm just gonna delete this and start over. Yeah, I gotta put it in a class. So you do uh, change this to be static, static, public static, bool is null or empty. Oh. 
right? I thought you could do this here. You can drop it by trimming and uh, the, the other way is just to delete it. Yeah, we, we'll need to trim it too, but for some reason it doesn't like the keyword this. That should work. The user name to check dot is no or empty. Yeah, it should have. Oh. Oh well, I'm not even gonna try. I'm hopelessly lost in the code right now. What what we could do though is we could um, we could change our validation in here or where'd we go? Validate in here. We could just change it instead of using all that custom stuff. I could write something like this instead with a trim on it, maybe if you wanted or needed. Uh, but still, I've got that validation wrapped away. You know, is null or empty? I don't have to put that. Maybe I need to check username on um, some other place as well, right? You know, I don't need to write the trim, check if it's not null, check if it's not empty. I don't have to write that code again. It's all wrapped up over here only. I only have one reason to change this class too. I only have a reason is to verify that it's a valid username. So all this stuff kind of makes sense. You guys see the benefit of changing to this in your code, the way you write your code away from a monolithic into SRP? Anyone not see a benefit? Wow, somebody's got to not see a benefit. I don't sell that good. Wow, you guys are easy to convince. So we're pretty much wrapped up here. The only thing I got left, I want to give a couple licenses of uh, ReSharper. We'll give two licenses of ReSharper, one license of dot .trace. ReSharper license is for currently for 3.1, although 4.0 went beta today, live beta. So the license will translate up into a 4.0 for you. And dot .trace, they just released last week, um, dot .trace 3.1, so we'll give a license to that away. So we'll go with you. We'll give you a, uh, you want resharper or dot trace? Does everyone know what resharper and dot trace are? Actually, you, you're more important because you're getting it. Which one do you want? Resharper or dot trace? Uh, I want resharper. You want resharper? Okay. So just come up and see me when we're done here. Um, okay. How about uh, anyone have a birthday today? <laughs> I'm just trying to find ways to give it away, man. Um, who's got a birthday close to today? Yeah. <laughs> I want to do the birthday one. Who's, who's birthday, who do they think has a birthday closest to today? When's your birthday? June 3rd. June 3rd? Anyone closer than that? May 3rd. May 3rd? Oh, God, I got to do the math now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys aren't helping me. Oh, what about you? May 3rd. What, sorry? May 31st. I don't even see the person that's saying that. <laughs> that's you. You said May 31st? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. Bloody hell. Why didn't you say that earlier? <laughs> Okay, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> when's your, uh, uh, what, what do you want, dot trace or resharper? Resharper? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know, what do we want to do um, for dot trace? Who came the farthest, other than me, <laughs> to, to attend this? Who, who's come from, who, where are you from, man? I'm from Bangalore. Bangalore, no, there's a guy way up at the back there. Bangalore? Is everyone here from Bangalore? Tonight? Tonight? So are you saying which? You Mangalore. Mangalore. Sorry. I have no idea. <laughs> you guys got to change the name so I can tell the difference. Um, so it's Chennai and Mangalore. I have no idea which is farther away. It's, oh my god. You guys got to help me here, man. Is there anyone from like Mumbai or something like that? Where? I have no idea what you said. You're touring? <laughs> student. Great, you're a student, you can have it. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks a lot for coming out, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to pick me up. I've got two more presentations this afternoon, so I'm not going to be all that available this afternoon. Um, I will be available as much as I can be, and then tonight at the Champagne and Cheese thing, I'll be there to answer any questions. Shoot me an email if you wanted to. Thanks a lot for coming in.